Okay, so minus so there is an enormous capacity within each person that is mostly unused to respond well to life in a happy and harmonious way requires intelligence. Okay. However, intelligence is seldom abundant in any person, and whatever capacity for intelligence exists can always be improved. We can always get more intelligent, no matter how smart we think we are. So acquiring in increasing intelligence requires an understanding and application of the fundamentals of esoteric psychology. That is what we teach in Gnosis, this esoteric psychology. Right? This is what we're talking about. Um, and so we're talking about intelligence, but more like real intelligence. We always think that we're all very intelligent, but it has to do with mundane things, mainly. In Gnosis, we know that the intelligence we're, we're talking about is a higher type of intelligence, more spiritually oriented. Maybe we can dim the lights a little bit before there. Uh, forgot about that. Does that help everybody? Okay. So now we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of esoteric psychology. This should be a little bit of review. If I'm going too fast, you can let me know. You can slow down. Ask lots of questions. We can have lots of conversations. So, the structure of the human psyche consists of, and this is, this is mainly review, the ego. Right? This is 97% of our consciousness. I think this is phase A, maybe, phase B. The personality, which is the vehicle of manifestation for the egos, Oh, or the being, not of the being, sorry. Should be. It's a, a vehicle for a manifestation of either the ego or the being. And then there's the essence, which is the 3% awakened consciousness. Mm -hmm. The ego and the essence are subject to the laws of return and recurrence, embodying many personalities over many different lives. <laughs> so you guys kind of understand the relationship there already. The personality is just the vehicle for the ego, or if we incarnate our higher selves, we'll be the vehicle for the higher self. This is what we're talking about with esoteric psychology. Um, our mind is also part of our psyche. We're going to talk about the mind a bit. There are aspects of our mind that deal with thoughts, emotions, feelings, and instincts. These aspects of our mind manifest in the different centers of our body. This is going back to the five centers. The five centers of a human machine, and they are the intellectual, the motor, the emotional, the instinctive, and the sexual. This kind of stuff might be on a test is why we're reiterating it. But I mean, it's just so you guys see it more than once. Also on the test, I know that they, when they ask you where they're located, the emotional center is located in the solar plexus. And that picture, I know I want this picture. Yeah. But that's from one of the texts. But it's because, you know, you got to get the, the five... The five centers of the human machine, then there's the three brains, and everything's got different numbers and located in different places. Where's that instinctive pointing to? The instinctive is the, uh, the base of the spine, oh. Cossacks. And the motor? Point? The motor is the, the top vertebrae of the spine. Do we have to know those specific things? Um, it's on the test. Oh. <laughs> We're going to review the test before we have to take it. And stuff, but, but I was going to say, what if we fail? We're going to start all over again? No, no, no. You can't do that. Yeah. You're not going to fail. They're going to say, okay, Ed and Phil can't teach Facey anymore. we got to find new instructors. Okay. So now we're going to look at three ways to react to situations. And this is the three ways Samuel talks about that we can react to any situation in life. The first one is the emotional, the emotional, instinctive, impulsive reactions. Right? The second, is in intellectual reasoning. We can, with any situation, we can intellectually reason it. And the third is awareness. And now we're going to we'll look at each one of these individually. So for the first thing, emotional reaction, this is the lowest form of reaction to the situations of life, right, as we can imagine. It's ego-driven, it's automatic, mechanical. Uh, it's a reaction from our subconscious that tends to lead to, to problems and regrets, right? So if someone insults us, we automatically get mad. If someone has more than us, we feel jealous. Violence begets violence, and hate begets hate. It's 100% ego control, basically. And you can see this in any situation. People can even use that to other people's advantage. If they want something from you, they could be like, be really nice to you, because they know that makes people happy, you know? Or it's, yeah. just, it's, it's just when we see that kind of stuff. It, it's good to know about this, because a lot of people don't know about this. And they think, OK, someone made fun of my glasses, and now I'm going to fight them. <coughs> And that's how most people live their life, you know? And they think, well, you can't make fun of me because that's how I roll, right? They don't even know that there's this other way. And most people don't even know that there's a thing called an ego. 
So once we start to see this, we can start to say, okay, wait a minute. If someone makes fun of me and then I react mechanically, I'm, an, I'm just being an animal. I'm, someone's ringing the, the bell and the dog's coming for, the, for his dinner. That's all it is right there. There's nothing higher going on. It's nothing more than a program machine. And then with the egos living vicariously through us and controlling us the entire time. Second is intellectual reasoning, which we think is way better. Because, but if we remember, the intellect is the only faculty that separates us from the animal. So it's basically, you can think of it in the range of faculties that you can acquire with clairvoyance and clairaudience and all this. The intellect is pretty low on the scale. And it can be very ego-driven also. So this way of reacting can be more fair than the emotional way, but still has problems. We still have a lot of problems with this one. Because there's, everybody's still bound by their prejudices, their biasness, selfishness, and maliciousness. And intellectual reasoning can lead to more of this kind of thing. Because uh, it's, the state can be extremely ego-driven. It's mechanical and self-interested calculations. That's what makes it the big, the massive problem with it. You can plan and devise ways to satisfy the ego. You know, deceitful, manipulative, masterminding. This is all from intellectual reasoning. The ego will always justify and rationalize itself. That's the other problem with the intellect. The intellect can still be used by the ego more so almost than the physical body to always be justifying what you're doing. There's a, there's a mathematical equation from the Kabbalists which is pretty funny that if, if pain is greater than pleasure, that equals no movement. And if pleasure is greater than pain, that equals movement. And then they, they can judge everybody by that, they say. Even, they say, tell you to look for that in your own life and you'll see it come up. Because even when you think that you're doing something, like sacrificing right now, it's, it's calculated. It's so you can get a benefit at the end, you know. Maybe you're going to go on a juice fast right now because you want to be, be beach body ready or something like that. You know, it's still, still sort of selfish in the end. But uh, the intellectual reasoning is higher. It is higher than the than the emotional one, because now we're thinking about it. But from thinking about it is how, how you get some of the worst crimes, the conspiracy type stuff, and planning on how to actually get something from your neighbor, and by doing, by like being nice to them, but to try to get something for yourself, whatever, that's, that's more malicious than just getting mad at them for saying something mean to you. Yeah. So now you're using higher faculties to find a way to get around being... I don't know which one's worse, though. I mean, that would be a, a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. This, one can be, this one can be much, yeah. much worse, yeah. Because, I mean, even with the first, you don't have to fight someone. You maybe just blow up or something, yeah. but you're not malicious and calculating it. Right figuring out yeah. how to, to uh, make this person suffer or how to try to get the most, exactly. I think that's even worse. Yeah, and it is because we know that the, the toughest yeah. egos are in the intellectual <laughs> realm. The hardest egos are the egos of the mind. Yeah. It's the mm -hmm. hardest because, uh, you know, because like... Because like it says, you just start justifying, rationalizing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, I deserve this and, uh, you know, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> And just to make yourself feel good. Well, you know, it's the ego, isn't it? That, sure that it is. is telling you this, so you keep on doing it because yeah. it's got control over you, yeah. right? And, and you think that it's you and it thinks it's you. And you well, think you identify thing. with yeah, it. Exactly. Yes. It's always a good, a good, you know, marker to say, if I'm justifying something I'm doing, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Because you've yeah. never had to justify a good deed. You don't exactly. have to justify so that's something that's right. Yeah. That's right, because you know inside is right. Yeah, because if you're like, well, I didn't help, I didn't pull over to the side of the road and help them, but it's because I'm so busy and I'm such an important guy, I have to go to the Gnostic Center and give a lecture or something. It's like, well, okay, now you're justifying why it's okay to be bad. Yeah. And that, 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 that leads to a lot of problems. And a lot of justifying and rationalizing leads to some of the most problems. Yeah. If you see, like, I don't know, the craziest example, obviously, is the World War II and the Nazis, and they're justifying what they're doing because, <laughs> you know, you guys talking about that? Yeah, exactly. They justify what they're doing because they're doing it for the fatherland and for humanity in general, they, yeah. according to their own prejudices and biasness. Like that, that was just a lie they were telling themselves so they could so they just fulfill yeah. their deeper yeah, exactly. desires. You can see this a lot. Their, their, their yeah. prejudice. Like, like, I had a guy come in one time, not that I'm telling so, so someone came in and said, I donated some clothes. I was donating some clothes. So I gave, went to hand them to the guy. And he's like, oh, thanks. Just throw them over there. And I'm like, no, these are really fancy clothes. You're not just going to throw them in the pile amongst the other clothes. I'm like, well, it almost seemed like, you know, you're being more arrogant by donating these clothes and telling people how fancy they are than 
than, than if you just didn't donate them at all. But that's you know? right. I mean, so the ego finds ways to hide and hide and hide. And <laughs> so, every yeah. good deed, you gotta... Yeah. That's why, like someone else says, you gotta be like a, a sentry, like a guardian in the time of war. You gotta be a you're, pit bull. You're in the battle. It's happening right now. Right now. So when he donated those clothes, he said they were fancy clothes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> they were just going to throw them amongst the other pile. We said, no, no, they got to go somewhere. Oh, take oh, it right to oh, your manager. Said that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. You take okay. these right to the high end Toronto thrift stores. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and then the third way is awareness with awareness. This is, this is the highest way. And it, it, it is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit vague, but, but we can get the gist of it. This is the best form of reaction to any given situation mm -hmm. in life. Immediately comprehend truth above the mechanical emotions and intellectually calculating egos. This is understanding the truth above the intellect and above the ego. It's above the self-interested, erroneous state of the ego. This is the path of gnosis, the revolution of the consciousness. So, I mean, to react with awareness, okay, this is the best way to go do it, but I mean, it, it requires doing the work of the path to get to this state. It requires great conviction and great dedication. And have to work in the three factors. This again is review. It will also be on the test. Which are the birth of the solar bodies, the death of the ego, and the sacrifice for humanity. Through doing these things, you can come to awareness. But to just sit here and say, hey, well, I'm just going to start being aware. It doesn't really work like that because you have to start eliminating ego before you can even become aware. It's a, it's a long observation. Self-observation, exactly. Death, death and motion. And, and we'll talk about some other ways uh, of doing that. And awareness is going to come up in my next lecture too, which will be in two weeks, when we talk about uh, specifically meditating on the ego. But, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the mind. The mind. So first, when we say the mind, everyone thinks of the brain. When we talk about the mind, most people generally think of the brain. Um, if we think the brain is the mind, we're quite mistaken. This is directly from someone else, all this stuff. <coughs> the brain's job is to deliver us information that we can handle without overwhelming or confusing us. <coughs> um, we perceive a massive amount of data at any given time, more data than we're even aware of, more data than we perceive we're, 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 our brain is you know, taking in. The brain filters and funnels that data into small enough packages so that we can understand the world around us. The brain acts like a reduction valve, limiting and condensing the information gathered from our surroundings. It reduces it so we can understand it. In this way, the brain does more to limit our perception than it does to illuminate it, which is kind of a funny uh, way. This I got from the Kabbalistic text, this part. But uh, it, it makes sense if you think of what the brain's actually doing. It's a physical organ to try and make sense of the physical world. So, of course, it's blocking out a lot. So we can't, we can't readily perceive ultraviolet or infrared, but we know it exists. We can only perceive you know, a certain bandwidth of, of sound. But we know that exists, and our, our brain, they say they, they can perceive all this information, but it kind of filters it down so we can understand the world around us. Because all of all of our brains are working the same way, we're all generally perceiving the world sort of the same way, with our own spins, our own, our own spin on it too, but we'll get more into that. So the brain versus the mind, there is a difference. The brain is merely the instrument of the mind, not the mind itself. The brain's job is to receive and elaborate thoughts, but it's not the thought itself. The brain is the physical organ needed to manifest the mind in the physical world. The mind itself is subtle and can become independent from physical matter. The mind can travel through time and space independent of our brain. And we can see this, we can verify this for ourselves even a little bit if we get a little bit of consciousness, say, a lucid dream. You ever had a lucid dream where you're having a dream that something seems odd and you're like, I think that's kind of weird. And then you say, wait a minute, I think it's weird that I'm thinking and my brain's over there in my bed. You know, it's not attached to me right now, I'm in my astral body. That's the idea of the mind. The mind is bigger than the brain. It funnels it down in the physical world, but you have thoughts and you experience things in the astral as well, even on, even on the level of dreams. If you haven't verified it for yourself, I mean, that's the most important thing to do, but you, could, you don't have to take the word, our words for it, but... You'd have to assume, okay, then the astral body comes out at, at sleep, and in your dreams you're still perceiving things, and you're still thinking, and all this stuff's still going on, but your physical brain is not part of this body. Mm -hmm. physical brain is lying in bed with the etheric body, just having a nap, taking it easy, and living the good life, and you're out having these crazy adventures <laughs> in the astral plane. Right? Talking to pink elephants and everything like, like Lee always talks about. <laughs> so it's different that way, the mind. So. 
The mind has many depths, regions, subconscious areas, nooks. Nevertheless, something valuable is in its center, something very important at the center of the mind. And that's the essence, the consciousness, what we're trying to liberate. It's at the center of the mind. We must comprehend all the mistaken functions of the mind, such as our absurd ways of thinking, our wrong habits, our mechanical behaviors, our wrong views. Egos must be comprehended and eliminated from all the levels of the mind, conscious and subconscious. Samuel talks about this concept a lot, about like the psychological moon, how the moon has a face we see, and the moon also has a dark side that we never see. But the consciousness and the subconscious is just like that. So we start eliminating egos and think, okay, I'm going to start being... I, what, what can I do that's better? I don't know. I'm going to be stop being so mean to my family. And you start there, but then that mean per ego is still there. It's just manifesting now in another way, maybe to someone who's not in your family, right? Or something like that. So every ego has, has a dark side, too, that you don't even know exists yet. That we have egos that we, we can't even comprehend yet. Even the, the good things of ourselves that we think are really good are also ego, which is a hard concept to understand. Some of our, our better principles think, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, we're all doing nice things here, and I bought my wife flowers, and she's really happy, and all this kind of stuff. But, I mean, the, the ego works in such a hard way that everything in the end seems to mostly be about self-benefit. If you really look at it, and if you, if you really start analyzing every situation, it seems overwhelming, but that's why we start with the roots, right? The, the roots, we start with the obvious ones. We start with the ones like manifesting physical anger, and this kind of thing. We started with the ones that we know, like, say, not to pick on smokers, but if you're smoking, <coughs> say, I'm going to quit smoking. That's an external, you know, representation of, like, an internal defect. It's basically like an ego, only it's externalized in smoking. So you say, get rid of that, and it'd be easier to quit doing that than it would be quit most of our e egoic ways, which is, but, I mean, we work on it a little bit at a time. Does this make sense? I'm going to keep following. All right. I don't want to talk too fast, so I gave a lecture also on Phase C, and I told them, Talking too fast, you gotta slow down your talking. <laughs> so I'm trying to talk slow. Only then will we know the reality of the being. Once we comprehend the ego on all our levels. So obviously that goes back to the same idea that if you know you want to get rid of, say, pride, then the the easiest examples of it are the ones you start with first. You know, I'm proud of. The family I'm born into. Well, that has nothing to do with the essence. It has nothing. That's only a personality. <coughs> so you have to start eliminating that pride, and then you'll find deeper and deeper and deeper manifestations of pride, and it goes deeper and deeper. And uh, it takes a long time. How about eliminating ego from the subconsciousness? Yeah. Subconscious. Subconsciousness. Yeah. Can you give an example? Well, I mean, Samuel talks about having 40, uh, eight, 48 levels of the mind. And so that goes into the subconscious, and you have, to, you have to go deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper to the subconscious stuff. Egos you didn't even know you had. Once you start eliminating egos and defects that you, you can observe and notice, you'll start getting better at self-observation. You'll notice that egos or problems you think you, you didn't even know you had will start becoming more clear to you that there are these egos that exist within you, which are more from the subconscious level. And then through eliminating egos from the subconscious <coughs> is how you become fully conscious, fully awakened <coughs> kind of thing. Because this goes this like hand in hand with also, you know, doing the working working in alchemy and working with the energies. It all helps towards this kind of thing. That's why you need so much power for it. Because all these egos exist in the subconscious. The idea is these awakened masters, they don't have a subconscious. The subconsciousness. Everything's conscious, fully conscious. Mm -hmm. They don't have a subconscious because wow. ninety seven the ninety seven percent that's asleep has been awakened. They freed, they freed this, this, this consciousness. So we're like prisoners. Yeah, exactly. So actually, it's like peeling an onion, right? Yeah, that's you what take I was the outer that. layer, yeah. Yeah. and then, then you find mm -hmm. another layer, and you get rid of that one, and then you mm -hmm. see there's another layer. Exactly. And as you keep going, yeah. when, you know, you might go through 20 or 50 layers before you get to the center. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is a lot like that, for sure. And the same thing is once you start eliminating ego and waking up consciousness, this consciousness will help you discover more. It'll be easier. It's not like we're always going to be at this level. No. You know, it's hard. I don't even know what my mistakes are. We'll start with the obvious ones. Start eliminating those ones. And then as, yeah. as they get eliminated and more essence becomes freed, you'll understand more. You'll have a better viewpoint. And you'll be able to see egos you didn't even know you had yet. And so so you, your consciousness grows and grows that way. So right now, like the idea of tackling our subconscious seems impossible. It's subconscious. We are not conscious of it. 
You can't do it. You start with the conscious, and when you free that, you can start working at the subconscious level. I've actually read that. Oh, I've actually read a technique for absorbing the subconscious, um, and essentially it's like the way it, the way it's uh, described in this book I read was essentially you you write down uh, it's like going through the process of observing how we judge others. So first yeah. you write down what is it that I don't like about this person, and then you erase the you and you turn it into a me, and yeah. then and then you get to really see uh, what what you uh, don't like about yourself, and Absolutely. in the way that the reason we judge others is because uh, ultimately like we're externalizing our egos into yeah. them when they may even not exhibit the things we're judging them for. Absolutely. Someone else mm -hmm. talks about it all the time. Mm -hmm. you, only, you only perceive egos in other people if they exist in yourself. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's not. Because you identify with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, I was just going to say that uh, even the good egos we have to eliminate yeah. because we True. have also good egos. So, uh, but uh, a good technique would be the meditation. But I guess that we do talk about that yeah. 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 elimination of the ego oh, yeah. in depth. Because yeah. meditation might help us to go into the subconscious and yeah. the, the deeper level, like <coughs> 49 <coughs> levels of yeah. the sub subconscious. So um, I guess that. Yeah, that's actually what the other lecture is on meditating on the ego, how to precisely meditate on the ego. <coughs> like what sure. kind of good ego are you talking about? A uh, good ego would be, for instance, uh, when we give uh, f uh, give like money to a drug dealer, or to a smoker, or fat, or yeah, oh, a pen handler, a pen handler, yeah. exactly a like a pen handler or a but person. You, yeah, uh, that's a good ego. That's a good ego. Well, we perceive yeah. it as being good because we're giving. Yeah. 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 We're only giving their addiction, addiction for you give their money to an alcoholic person, yeah. for instance, to go yeah. and, and buy more alcohol. So so yes, yeah. yeah, so he can yeah. kill himself. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 And also because everything that we are right now isn't our highest being, right? We're ego. Unless, unless we're manifesting our, our father who's in secret in us right now, then we know that. Everything that we are is basically not opposite, but it's not <coughs> that, so we know it can't be what has to stay. So even like the good parts of myself and stuff that I, I tend to like, you know, I'd be like, well, it's, it hasn't helped me reach my father who's in secret, so it can't be part of him, therefore it's ego, it's not part of me, if I want to associate myself with my higher self. It's just a who you, yes? Well, what about a person, my friend just emailed me and she was watching, I think it was Dr. Oz, about this really obese woman, and she, my friend writes back, I hate fat people. <laughs> and so... I'm prejudiced, isn't it? Yeah, it's not a very nice is thing that to say. Yeah, for sure it is. But yeah. it's prejudice. not a reflection of her, because, like, you know, she's... But she's prejudiced against these oh, people, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that that's evil, but that's I just want... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought it would be... Yeah, but it's the same thing. But like I was trying to go with what Justin was saying, like, if I hate fat people, then you should... Have oh, that that it's around. a reflection, yeah. 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 But if she's not fat, then how? It would most likely it would be some kind of a manifestation of her wanting to be angry, and a lot of people will find will do this. They'll find ways to justify their anger. So if they if they do it in a good like if someone makes fun of my little brother, I want to beat them up. Well, is it because you really protect them, your little brother, or is it because you want to find a way to manifest your anger? Yeah, that can be. Yeah, yeah and also, uh, what I was going to say. Um, but you're also. Uh, <coughs> You want to uh, like when you're judging someone? Okay, oh I'm oh I hate fat people. Look at how horrible they look. You're trying to make yourself feel better by putting somebody else down. Sure, sure. That's not a way to make Maybe yourself it's feel anger better. at their lifestyle, though. I think that's what really um, or, or, or that's why you're thinking they're 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 lazy Pride. and uh, they're gluttonous or, or eating, whatever. Yeah, like you know. Junk food. Basically, but, what would be is yeah. But it's still a way of trying to make yourself feel above them, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, and this mm -hmm. person probably mm -hmm. has uh, mm -hmm. other problems yeah, that, that, way. that you don't know. They don't have to focus on this person. Maybe this person is really mean, but she's skinny. So she's like, I hate fat people because at least I'm not fat. But maybe this is a way of diverting your attention from focusing on your own problems. Well, That's probably right. she thinks she's better because she thinks she, mm -hmm. her lifestyle and diet are better yeah. than that That's right. fat woman. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have it. We all us. have it inside yeah. of us. It's in all of so us. So in that legal situation, we can have several manifestations. Of yeah, absolutely. Pride. Pride. Yeah. 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 For sure. Uh, and when, and when you really don't feel good about yourself right away, you, you try to put your anger out on somebody else. Exactly, say, yeah. say if you don't feel good about what you did or, or 
you feel that you could have done better or if there's any regrets or whatever, uh, you, I find sometimes, you know, it's, it's easier to get, uh, to, to um, get angry at somebody else or yeah. transpose that anger into them, you know. Absolutely. Oh, yes, for sure. look at them, you know. Yeah. At least I'm not like that. Yeah. Whatever. So I was like, oh, yeah. I might have been really mean to my girlfriend but at least uh you know at least i'm not ugly or something you know? yeah at like, least i don't beat the crap out of trying to yeah. find a way like to build themselves up still so they don't yeah. have to ever deal with your defects that's the last thing a person wants to do is start realizing that they have problems yeah everybody puts themselves on a pedestal yeah Every, and we all do it and we all do it all the time and we get to here we get to hear this different stuff and we get to start applying it to our life so we can see how, how much of a different world there is when you start realizing this stuff but in reality, most people are always putting themselves on a pedestal, and they always want to protect themselves and their feelings. They're really at the whim of the world around them. They're at the whim. It's like, oh, yes. God, please don't say something bad to me. Please don't judge me. Please don't say that I'm not good at this, you know. And people, and once you start working on the ego and that, you can start to rise above that a little bit. And you'll start to realize that the, the same part that gets mad when someone insults you is the exact same ego that, that gets really happy when someone just praises you for no reason. Yes, just the it's the same side. thing. You're still reacting pretty much spontaneously to somebody else's external input. Yeah. They say, you know, I don't like your glasses, you suck. Oh, man, I'm mad at you. I love your glasses. Oh, thanks, man. We're best friends. Let me buy you a drink, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's the exact same thing, but it's flip sides of the coin. That's right. So, and it's easier to start with the negative ones because it's easier to wrap our heads around that. Right, right. But it's, hard, it's harder once we start saying, okay, some of the good stuff, is it good? Or am I trying to build myself? Why am I doing these things exactly? Yeah, or why, why do you let your, the others control whether you're going to be happy or not, exactly. you know? Yeah. And, and that's what Lee used to say, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you allow a circumstance and other people, if, you know, make you happy, then think of all the times when you're not happy. Yeah. Because all the other times then you're not happy. Yeah. Yeah, it defines for you exactly what happiness is, and then most yeah. of the times you're not in that. Yeah. So you basically just define what unhappiness is, and exactly. you put yourself in that more times than you're in happiness. That's right. That is that is true. That's why they, that's the the lecture about the pendulum. Yeah, the yeah. pendulum yeah. and the shadow. Yeah. Trying, to, yeah, trying yeah, to stay yeah, in the center. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of that stuff comes up when we get into more of the psychological stuff, like the way that Facey is going to be going now into more of the psychological. So we're going to talk about the mind as it as it grows a little bit. So first, the young mind, like in the in the child and the baby. Very flexible, they're very alert, they're very inquisitive, right? The child always asks why, they always want to know more, they perceive details that adults don't appreciate. You can see that working with children, if you had children, or seeing like little kids and everything, it always seems like they're, they're tapped in a little bit more, you know? It seems like the, the baby's crying and it's crazy, like, why is it crying? And then he's happy all of a sudden, it's like, what's going on with these kids? But the, their minds are more flexible, but they're really open, they're like per perceiving everything and they're not judgmental, they haven't increased all this ego yet and they haven't been bound you know by experience and, and pain and suffering so they're, they're really wide open minds you know and i've seen this one uh, one documentary it was out of body experiences and this russian guy uh died went out of his body and then he was in a hospital and then the babies were coming in this baby's crying and like asking the baby why are you crying he's got a broken hip but he can talk to the he can talk to all these people in the astral and then uh, the guy ended up getting resuscitated and came back and went in there and said the baby's got a broken hip and then they looked and he did have a broken hip they didn't understand why this baby was crying so i mean it's a it's a documentary but it's just one example that if, if you took that one at face value you could see that these children are open and alert and communicating with the astral plane because they basically just came from there yes or from the spiritual realms right? that's right they basically just came from unbornness into being born in the physical so they're, they're a little more open that way. And this is why we always know as kids are always like, why? 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 They want to know everything. Why? We got to ask questions. We got to understand. We want to know. And they always come up with different reasons. Like you tell them, it's like this. Like, well, why is it like that? Maybe it's like this. And kid, kids are good at, at doing that. <laughs> now, as we grow older, we see we all know the story changes. The flexible mind begins little by little to become more rigid and crystalline, crystallizing, becoming more stone-like. We start to get more fixed in our ways. We accumulate more and more eyes, like or the, or the eyes that we accumulated in past lives that start to manifest more and more. Uh, we get more bad habits and prejudices. And this, you can see this happening. And then, you know, once you become a teenager, you know everything already now. And, and then they're totally different. The, and then you get to the old mind. And that's fixed, stone-like, and unchanged. Generally, this is wide brush stuff. 
So the old mind becomes totally petrified within the prejudices, fixed ideas, wrong views of the individual. If you spend a lot of time, you know, you're alert, you start getting prejudices and experiences, and you say, this is the way the world is, then you stick to that. Tend to. This is in general. People tend to. Obviously, when you're on the spiritual path and you're looking at your psych psychology and your psyche and stuff, it's a little more than just, say, most of humanity that just goes through without even knowing about the ego or this kind of thing. But you can see that with older people who don't want to, don't like the music that the kids are playing and all this kind of stuff and don't want to learn the computers and all this kind of thing. It kind of shows like the, just an outward, superficial state of what the mind is like. They've been stuck in their ways and uh, they're very unchanging. Um, it is unfortunate that a person's mind becomes petrified like stone over time. The mind of every person becomes bottled or trapped in the prison of the past. We're always in the past, daydreaming of the past, remembering the past, dreaming of the future, very rarely in the present. The mind becomes trapped in many prisons. Jealousy, hatred, personal attachments, personal suffering, family problems, desires for wealth and social status. People always take pleasure in bottling the mind. That's the funny part about it, too. Like, we have all these problems, but we're addicted to it, too. We're addicted to it and we love it because we're so identified with the ego that we think it's us. So we'll always we'll always be looking for these problems and people, you, you probably know people, you get together and talk and everybody wants to take a turn complaining about how bad their life is. And I got this problem. Oh yeah, well I got this problem, this problem. People seem kind of just to relish in it and they just kind of exacerbate the whole situation kind of thing. But it, it's true. Uh, the, the mind's bottled in these prisons, these egos. And... Uh, People tend to be really attached to them, like family problems and stuff. That can really affect people. They can really carry <coughs> that with them to the point where they think that's like the entirety of their being. It's like, oh, you know, no one, no one talked to me. Uh, I got beat as a kid or something. I don't know. You know, I'm just snowballing here. But people can really attach that and identify that with who they are, as opposed to some of the higher stuff we've been talking about, the idea of this essence and stuff. So it's rare, rare are those who resolve to shatter to pieces the bottle. So that's some Samael, how he talks, but what he's saying is people who start eliminating the ego and start freeing the mind. It's very rare. It's very rare. It's so rare because it's difficult, and it's a lot of personal responsibility. When you have these kind of problems, you, you can basically <coughs> pass the buck. Now, everything that's wrong with your life came from something over here. It wasn't your fault. It was your childhood and all this. And so the way I am is just because this is how I got raised, and this is what they showed me, and my parents are like this to me, so I'm going to be like this to my kids and everything like that. But it, when you start saying, okay, I want to rise above that, it becomes very difficult. Then you have to realize that you're the only one in control of your life. You're the only one in control of your problems. Any problem from the past that's affecting you right now is because your mind is in the past, dwelling on it, carrying that with you like baggage. And that when we start to realize this, we realize, oh, there's a great amount of work that has to be done here, and the only one that can do it is me. It comes to the point, too, where you, I could read all the books on Samael on board and, and read everything that was ever written in occult literature, but I have to do it. It starts with me. I have to put it into practice. Nobody's going to practice it for me. That's the fundamental difference between Gnostic Christianity and the fundamental Christianity, the idea that someone died for your sins, and now it's okay, you got the... I don't know, free, you get the free ride, you say, he died, okay, I was with Jesus, okay, you're in, you know, like, Gnostic Christianity is like, no, he showed you the way, he, he was this awakened master that gave you this path, you have to walk it, you have to walk it, you know, it's, it's up to us, so, I mean, I like that, but it is, it is, it's heavy, but it's good to know, it's also good to know that you're not in the control of, of the situations around you, that you're the one in charge. Now we're going to talk about the three minds, because there's always three somethings, five somethings, or seven somethings. This is the three minds. That was a joke, sorry. But uh, the uh, first one we're going to talk about is called the sensual mind. Then there's the intermediate mind, and finally the inner mind. These are different aspects, different levels, basically, of the mind. So the sensual mind. Yeah, the sensual mind is based solely on the information and impressions that are experienced through the five senses. And that's why it's sensual. There's nothing romantic going on there. <laughs> <laughs> the sensual mind is completely subjective and limited by the senses. This mind only operates with what it receives from the five senses. It cannot know truth 
or illumination. If the sensual mind could lead to illumination, then the general mass of humanity would be illuminated. This, we know, is not the case. As we're mostly bottled up in our sensual mind, <clears throat> operating off our senses, and that's what forms reality for us. Right? The only source of nourishment is brought by the external sensory perception. So this mind is basically the lowest form of mind. Everything you see, hear, touch, taste, or smell, this is, this is what it views as reality. Nothing above or beyond that. Second one is the intermediate mind. Religious beliefs are found within the intermediate or middle mind. These beliefs are above and beyond the simple realm of the five senses, obviously, when we start talking about God and, and the idea of immortality and life and death and heaven and hell. The middle mind works with data brought by religions, superstitions, and philosophies. So, so the middle mind works with all these theories or different schools and ideas, basically. So ideals, morals, ethics, dogma, perceptions of the deity, all this kind of stuff is found within the, the intermediate mind. Although the intermediate mind is nourished by religious views, it is still very subjective and differs greatly depending on each individual. Right, because everybody's intermediate mind would be totally different based on your upbringing and your, your geography, where you're born, what religion you're born into. Like, the right. main differences between, say, Muslims and Jews and Christians is all in here. And if they say, no, this is the truth, because I read it and I found it in, in these books, <clears throat> then you know it's kind of driving a wedge in between people still. It's not, not really leading to truth. It's higher than the sensorial mind, because now we're starting to admit or, or contemplate things that are bigger than ourselves, or, or ideas that are more abstract than the physical world. <coughs> but still, it's very subjective. <coughs> very subjective. And then there's the inner mind. The inner mind works with information brought by the superlative consciousness of the being. So it's direct connection to the being. Only with the inner mind can we know truth. Truth is beyond sensorial perceptions and dogmatic religious beliefs. Truth is not something we touch, taste, and it is not something we read about or are taught. The big difference is truth is only known through experience. And that's what makes it true. And... Um, only in the inner mind do you experience it. That's the big difference between the inner mind and the intermediate. Intermediate mind, we weren't experiencing anything for ourselves. We were just reading it, or our church told us this, or my family raised me this way. So it was these beliefs that were above the senses, but it wasn't based on truth. The inner mind bases it on experience, direct experience of truth. With the inner mind, we can know about life and death, karma, return, recurrence. We can know about all of this, and we can know it without saying, well, I read it in this book, and I think that's true. That would be the intermediary of mine. Knowing it, experiencing it, saying, maybe experiencing the Akashic Records, then you say, I know, I was there, I experienced it. I, maybe I can't experience it for you, but if you experience it, you would know too, kind of thing. And people know other stuff that people... So with the inner mind, we can truly know objective reality, and that's the big difference between objective and subjective reality. Yeah. Right? Objective reality is truth. Subjective reality is what we perceive every day. Subjective through our senses. And there is no religion higher than truth. Is also that, That's a saying by the theosophist, Alina Blavatsky. But uh, there is no religion higher than truth is a beautiful saying because it's true. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't. <laughs> it's a tricky word, I know. <laughs> but, yeah. but, so like... You wouldn't have the arguments between the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims and the Hindus if they all experienced the truth and they all were tapped into the same truth. Because right, truth can't be subjective. We all say, I have a personal truth, and Justin has his personal truths. Well, then they're not truths, or only one of them is true, and one of them is wrong, because by the nature of the term, truth isn't subjective. You can't say, I think this is true, and I think that is true. That's more of like a belief. It's not truth. But if you experience truth, you'll know it's higher than religion and dogma because it's the ultimate. It's true. It's true. Now when we start talking about this kind of stuff, it's abstract a little bit for sure. So belief is a, is a subjective truth? We're gonna, yeah, we're going to talk about belief and faith too and see what okay. they are too. But yeah, exactly. Beliefs, I, I, I believe, beliefs can be good if you use them as like a as a starting point for your investigations. Yeah. Open-minded, say, That's okay, right. you know, it'd be like the idea like saying, if I, I believe that all roses are red, because I've never seen a white one. Okay, I believe that. I better go <coughs> check out some fields and make sure that I'm right. Then you go and you find a white one. Oh, man, I was wrong. 
It was white ones too. See, well, that belief drove me to go find out the truth. So that's okay. But if you're like, I don't know, like, like the Pope or something, like, all roses are red. Yeah, I saw a white one off of his head. Get him in there. Don't let him tell anybody there's a white one in there. <laughs> you know. So yeah, that's the difference. That's 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 the big difference there. Not to pick on the Pope or anything. <laughs> okay. So this is the path to develop the inner mind. So we're going to talk about how we can develop the inner mind because. But you know a little bit what the inner mind is now. So there's one. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me right there. Self-portrait. But uh, we know that the inner mind is tapped in directly to the being. And it's good to say that, but I mean, it is still pretty abstract. Because unless you're there, you don't know. And I, I don't know. But uh, Samael tells us a lot of stuff. So we'll get into subjective reasoning first. The intellect is completely subjective. Our intellect is 100% subjective. We've been talking about this. It demands proofs, demonstrations, and examples when speaking of karma, divine law, reincarnation, etc. They want concrete, physical proof of these spiritual principles. That's the intellect. The intellect will never understand these principles because it is caged up within the senses. And truth, as we'll see, exists outside of the senses, right? That's what makes it objective. The intellect is subjective because it is limited by the particular sensorial perceptions of the individual to interpret and understand reality. So that was a mouthful he gave us there, but it's basically, the intellect is subjective because it's subjected to our five senses. It's, it's, it's contained within our five senses. And we know that, we know for a fact that there's so much more to the world than where our five senses shows us. And we know this by instruments we make that can adapt to our five senses, like, you know, infrared lights, so we can see the infrared or the infrared goggles, and that's so we know infrared's out there. And all this kind of stuff, but it's still subjective because we have to make it fit our eyes. But we'll talk a bit, a bit about it. So spiritual facts cannot be comprehended by the intellect because these facts are universal truths that exist beyond the subjective reasoning of the five senses. So basically reiterated that again, but it's kind of a weird thing to say, so we got to try and understand it a bit better. The intellect alone is an unrefined and elementary faculty, right? Separates us from animals, like the first step away from being an animal, basically. Like we, we mentioned that. The truth is objective and cannot be limited by the senses. So, basically, another reiteration of the same thing, but I found a diagram that kind of explains it uh, maybe a little easier. So we look at this, you know, as objective reality or truth. This is truth, a really abstract thing. That's truth. This is the individual. This is you. A box closed off from the truth with just five slits on it. These five slits letting in truth are touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell. And we know each one of these is limited even. Like we know sight, if you study the electromagnetic spectrum, we only see this much of it, right? Electromagnet that we can see. Sound is the same way. Smell, we have a range. We know that more exists than that. We only get a sample of this, a sample of that, a sample of that, a little bit of that, and just a little bit of that. And based on that, you think we could find uh, reality? Well, maybe a part of it? No, nope. because then it gets processed through the ego. So now, the, now we're getting all this. This is what's coming from the external world, out here at the true, true world. This is what's coming in, getting processed through the mainframe computer of the ego. So... Based on all this, it'll take it and do what it wants with it, basically. You can see, you can see, basically, you know, the saying, you only see what you want to see and that kind of thing. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, the ego will put a spin on your five senses. So our, our five senses are never even that objective. They're all really <coughs> subjective to, to, first of all, what, the, what they're limited to in the range. Like, of, of the taste buds we have, there's more taste out there. We just don't have taste buds for them. You know, we can see more colors out there, but we don't have the, our eye doesn't have the bandwidth for it. And then within that ego, there's reality. There's our reality, subjective reality. This is what we understand as the world. Everything we understand about the world is understood inside of here. So in reality, we're cut off from the truth. We only get these five little bits of truth that get processed through here, and then that gives us our reality. So it's funny to think of it that way a little bit, but you know, you can kind of see how, how it is true that way. Like, so I'm experiencing something through my five openings and Justin through his and, and everyone through their own and everything we're experiencing right now is slightly different. Can you imagine stepping into someone's head right now and seeing what they see or see how they see it? You know it's going to be like a universe of, universe of difference based on their 
egos and the way they see things and what they like and don't like, that's where the ego comes into it. But this is basically the diagram that shows the difference between subjective reality and objective truth to try and get there. That's more like the Ainsoft type stuff we were talking about in, in, in the Kabbalah lectures. So let's go on from there. So we've got imagination. Imagination is a cognitive faculty that exists beyond the intellect. It's, it's above and beyond the intellect. A great artist must, must first imagine his masterpiece before he puts brush to canvas. There are two types of imagination. I mean, we can probably agree with this. An architect, before they want to build a building, they have to have, imagine what it's going to look like and place everything, and then they do it. The two types of imagination is, one is mechanical imagination. This is harmful to the conscious, consciousness. This is fantasy, daydreaming, formed by memory. This is what we mostly use our imaginations for. Really mechanical, this we're always in the past, remembering things, or fantasizing about the future. And that's like the ego-driven uh, imagination. Imagination, the ego's taking your imagination for a ride. So everything that you're thinking, you're imagining, you know, it's just so the ego can live out its fantasies, basically. The second kind is called conscious imagination. And thanks to this powerful faculty, images are formed in the perceptive center of the being. Perceptive center of the being. So we'll talk about this a little bit, what conscious imagination means. So developing conscious imagination raises us above the subjective reasoning of the sensorial mind. It is not possible to ascend the path if we remain bottled up within the sensorial perceptions of the intellect. So we, basically we have to start imagining these things beyond our five senses and that kind of thing. To ascend the path of initiation, three things are needed. Samuel stresses this in, a, in many of his books. They're imagination, inspiration, and intuition, and one leads to the next. Developing these faculties, one after the other, leads to, to the development of the inner mind, that inner mind we're talking about, is linked directly to the being. Basically, conscious imagination is the idea of, we'll talk about it more specifically in the meditating on the ego, but it's like, say when we're doing our meditation here, and we're imagining breathing in the light, and we're really focusing our imagination, we're imagining seeing this temple, we're imagining that we can see our divine mother, we're really imagining this stuff and really focusing on imagining this. It's not just like, okay, let's meditate. And all these pictures from randomly from your day comes by and you're thinking about, you know, what kind of cardigan sweater you're going to wear tomorrow or something. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, this is like really focusing the imagination. It's using it for a tool to lead to, uh, to uh, you know, to ascending the path, basically. You have to imagine it first before you can even experience it. The kind of thing is you have to start you know, opening up the, the doors of perception to, to it. So you have to start saying, okay, well, maybe, maybe objective reality exists outside of me and inside of me it doesn't really exist. So what would that be like? What would that actually be like here? Or they explain what the, the mental realm is like and then try to imagine what that would be like. Most specifically, it's used to, uh, in the next meditation that we're going to talk about in the next lecture when we, you know, imagine the ego, we see the ego, then we imagine putting it on a, in a courtroom and we're judging it and then the Divine Mother cuts its head off and that kind of thing. We're going to get into that stuff. But that's really using conscious imagination because you're, you're using your imagination now as a tool for a higher purpose. And, and you're using it, it's not using you like how it is most of the time. Now we'll talk about the inner mind, uh, faith versus belief. And they're very different in Gnosis. Samuel stresses it. By developing the inner mind, we experience reality and truth directly. We've said that. Um, through direct experience, authentic faith is born within us. Experience gives us faith. And the difference between faith and belief is, unfortunately in this day and age, belief is often confused with faith, or they use interchangeably as the same thing almost. I believe in this, I have faith in this. But faith is the direct perception of what is real, above and beyond the five senses, the body and the intellect, and it's a faculty of the inner mind. Through a through direct experience of the inner mind, you, you gain faith. Faith is like linked to truth. You have faith in this because you've experienced it. Belief is subjected to the inner prejudices, biases, upbringing, personality of each individual. And it's a faculty of the middle mind, the intermediate mind that we we're talking about. So belief is like how we were talking about your people's religious beliefs. And I'm not going to talk to him because he doesn't believe what I believe. And 
and this kind of thing. I have these beliefs that I assume are right, but if you experience the truth directly, then you have the faith. I have faith. I have faith that the astral plane is real because I've had an astral experience. It's not like the, the flip side of that would be I believe the astral plane is real because they talk about it at the NASA group and they don't seem to be lying unless they're all hallucinating, you know? So that's the flip side. That's how you use those two different terms. Faith is true wisdom, never vain belief. Belief is generally vain. Generally because people cling to it like it's truth, even though it's not. And that's the big, that's one of the big problems that we see, right? We can see how yes, my name is. Well, you finish your thought first. Just, you can see how belief is bad, go. Oh, okay. I don't know if you hear the end of that sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the idea being expressed right here is, is that, because um, obviously in our society we look at belief, or oh, some of us uh, look at as as a negative thing that um, th that hinders the mind. Sure. Um, but the idea being discussed here is is that belief rather is a tool to create faith. Yeah. Is, is that essentially the idea? It, it definitely can be and should be, I, I think. It definitely should be. Most of the times people use this and stay there. I, got, I believe this, and that, therefore it's true. But like we said, if you have a belief, like talking about the roses, and then you said if you use it to go find out the truth about that, then it leads to faith, then it's a good step. It's like a stepping stone from the, inner, from the middle mind to the inner mind, basically. But a lot of people get stuck right there. They just stay there. A lot of people are just in the sensorial mind, you know, atheist and that, what I see... Is what is true, you know? Show me it, I'll believe it. Yeah, I recall uh, an anecdote um, from the Master when a disciple asked him, uh, Master, do you believe in God? And he said, uh, No, I don't, because I know it. Yeah. So it's, uh, he was just trying to say that belief is different from faith, from right? Faith, yeah. Because it has, when one incarnates uh, the divine principles, we have. Um, we have experienced the real truth, so yeah. we don't need to believe. No, we don't need because to believe. We know. We experience. You have because faith. We know. Exactly. So it's it, different. It's only difficult in our, our minds, mostly because in the Western society and everything now, these words have become synonymous in the way that it's used. We don't think there's a difference, but there there is a total difference. And once you differentiate, differentiate these words, you can now see that there are these different levels that do exist. Most people think that their belief is truth. And you said, well, your truth can't be true, and his truth be true at the same time, because they're different. So one of them's not true, and everyone says, oh, it's his. Mine's true. But they realize that if, if, you, if you got to the level of the inner mind, he wouldn't believe something, and he wouldn't believe something, they'd both have faith, because they both know. They both experience it for what it is, beyond the subjective realm of the ego, right? Which really gives us this belief. But belief, being said, that said, belief can be good, as long as we use it in the right way. Like, for example, when, when I first came, started coming out here, I, they t told me a lot of stuff. And I was like, wow, I don't know. And I, they told me some stuff, and they told me if I do this, it'll work. So I'm going to believe them. So I did that. And then it worked. And then I thought, okay, now I don't have to believe them anymore on that part because it worked. I, you know, what, however small it might be, then, I, then I, in my mind what can be going is, they told me this, if I do this, this will happen. I believed them. I did that. That did happen. So the other stuff... I can sort of, you know, assume that it's they're doing the same thing. They're not lying to me. I just have to experience it for myself to really know, to really know. So, so that's the big difference between faith and belief. The idea is we have to free our mind. We need to liberate the mind. Unfortunately, people adore their slavery. Someone else says this a lot. They adore it. We don't think we do, but we're obsessed with ourselves and all the pain that we get and and even the smallest amount of things that goes wrong will always blow it out of proportion. Because why? Because why has it got to happen to me? You know, it's like we love ourselves so much. <laughs> <'Cause> it, is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, it is rare to find a person who does not have their mind bottled up in these, in these egos. We must comprehend the mind on all its many levels. We have to eliminate the psychological aggregates, right? The egos. We have to quiet and calm the mind. We must make the mind become receptive and passive so that it may be used as an instrument of the being, not of the ego. Only this way can we begin to incarnate that which is called soul. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff there. It, it's kind of important, too, to start to understand the idea that the mind and the ego are also different things. But it is, it is hard to understand a little bit. The way I try to think of it is 
there's always actors fighting over the stage or who's going to be in the spotlight. And the mind is that stage. It's that stage. It's the place that all this can happen. It can also be the place where the being can manifest through. So the mind itself isn't a negative thing, but we use it for the egos. We use it for the, yes. When you said the inner mind, the little mind, are there more? <laughs> there was just the, the inner mind, the middle mind, and then the first one was the uh, central. central mind. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Those are the three main ones that he talks about. But, yeah. So we also have impressions in our mind, too. And we'll have lectures on the impressions of the mind. But it's important that we start to receive these impressions correctly also. So not only do we have to eliminate egos, we have to start understanding and receiving impressions correctly. So it's a, it'll be another level to the, to the whole confusing thing, but I know you guys can get it because you're all smart. Yeah. Now we're going to go into the human soul. Yes? You mm -hmm. say our ego. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can have a boost every here and there. <laughs> a lot of little inspiration. <laughs> I believe it. There you go. Oh, no, I have faith. Yes, faith. Yeah. See, it's working. It's working. Nice. So we'll talk a little bit about the soul now. We've talked about it before, like on the Kabbalistic tree. We 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 understand the idea of the the human soul, the divine soul, and the intimacy. These are all. This is a little bit more general, but a little more informative. So, in most religions and philo philosophical traditions, the soul is thought to be the <coughs> self-aware essence, <coughs> unique to each particular living being. Right? The, the self-aware part of every person is thought to be the soul in most traditions. Thus, the soul is the true basis of the living being. The soul is generally thought generally thought to be immortal and to exist prior to and after the duration of the living being's physical life. In most, in most systems, this is what we find, a lot of similarities. The soul is before the physical birth and exists after the physical death. The soul is represented in this way within many different cultures. Well, we're going to look briefly at some of them. Like in Hinduism, according to the Bhagavad Gita, the soul is referred to as Purusha. The Purusha is a part of God. It is never born and it never dies. So now this one, we're, we're talking about a higher level of the soul that we, we might call the intimacy or the divine soul. It is unchanging, indestructible, and immortal. All living beings possess this purusha. This is just the basic idea of soul in Hinduism. Real basic. Um, Plato had a lot of big thoughts on this stuff. So Plato, based on the words of his teacher Socrates, considered the soul to be the essence of the individual person also. The, the, the very essence. He considered this essence to be the incorporeal, eternal occupant of our being. So the being was something that would be born, pass away, return to the dust, but the thing that's thinking and seeing and, and acting through this is this soul. Uh, as bodies die, the soul is continually reborn in subsequent bodies. So a lot of this seems really familiar to stuff we've heard in Gnosis because it's, a, it's kind of like a universal wisdom. It's found in a lot of areas. Uh, Valentinus. The Gnostic Christian. According to the spiritual psychology of the Gnostic Christian Valentinus, the human being is a threefold being. There's the body, which he called soma or heil, the soul, which he called the psyche, and the spirit, which is called the pneuma. All human possess all I should say all humans. All humans possess semi-dormant spiritual seeds, which he called the sperma pneumaticon. This seed in the developed Gnostic can unite with the spirit. So this is more like the idea that we come across in Gnostics and the Gnosis here that we have the essence is the seed of the soul that we have to develop to become in union with the spirit or the soul. Sometimes these words get are interchangeable too, spirit and soul in a lot of different traditions. I found from studying a lot of different traditions, it's mostly semantics that you gotta deal with. What one tradition is calling the ego, the other tradition is calling the being, and then you say this one's wrong because if they worship the ego, wait, no, they're calling their intimus the ego. So it's confusing that way. But uh, most, most, like a lot of cultures have a lot of similarities. We talk about Gnostic, Gnosticism with, you know, esoteric Hinduism and Kabbalism and the Sufis, uh, very similar stuff that, that, that they point to. So this idea of the spiritual seed being one of them. Valentinus's concept of the spiritual seed is identical with that of other cultures. It's called Shespa in Tibetan Buddhism, same kind of idea that we have the spark that has to be Jiva and Vedanta, Vedanta is being like an off, offshoot kind of sect of Hinduism. 
that deals with a very specific section of the Vedas called the Upanishads. These Vedas are massive, and they have all these different groups that different, like, kind of worship different parts. Uh, Ru in Sufism. The Sufis are like the uh, mystical Islamic, esoteric Islam. That's the Sufis. The whirling dervishes. That's the Sufis. Soul spark in other cultures. They have it in Kabbalah too, where they talk about the raising of the sparks. Everybody has to raise the sparks back up to recreate the original atom kind of thing. So it's kind of it's kind of universal across the board. We see this concept coming up again and again. Which is interesting to notice. It's not just in this basin we, we hear about this kind of stuff. But it makes more sense down here. So these cultures all agree that the human being has within a spiritual spark or seed that must be developed in order to reach illumination or unity with the soul or spirit in whichever way they, they call it in their particular group. But the idea is that we have a seed of that. We have to develop it. It's, it's not the full-blown thing yet. So in Gnostic Christianity... Uh, this, I believe, is, is from the, this isn't from the Gnostic Gospel, but from the, I don't know what you call the canonical text, the regular Gospels. But Jesus says to his disciples, In your patience, possess ye your souls. This is a quote from Jesus. In your patience, possess ye your souls. This indicates to us that our souls are a part of our being that we do not yet possess. So the, the idea that we don't possess our souls yet. We have this seed that we talked about, but that's not the soul. That's the, that's the essence. That's, that's what we need to develop. <coughs> and the soul, from, from all the massive Kabbalah stuff we've been doing, we know that the soul, it's a conjunction of laws, principles, virtues, and powers. It's like the higher aspects of, of ourselves, obviously. We're nothing like our soul because we're ego. Uh, each person has a divine, immortal soul, but they don't possess it yet. Everybody has a soul right now that we don't yet possess. But it exists. We do not have it incarnated. So we haven't built the vehicles to possess it. People have an essence. The psychic material needed to crystallize a soul. But they do not yet have a soul. So we have the essence. And we see that this is the material we need to create the soul. But we don't have the soul yet. The soul exists above and beyond us. If we do not yet possess our soul, is it possible to lose it? Yes. It is possible to lose your soul. I didn't mean to be so excited there with the exclamation mark. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> Samael talks about uh, those that enter the infernal worlds lose their soul. Once you, once you enter the infernal worlds, you're detached from your soul. Your divine mother becomes the, the one who starts persecuting you for all the things you've done wrong, and your soul doesn't go anywhere near that. And how sad it is to lose that treasure. This is what Dante's Inferno, the nine spheres of hell, I don't think we've talked about it. I don't know if you've had a lecture on that. Have you had a lecture on that? Good. Mm -hmm. So you guys all know that the tree of life, the upside down nine spheres, is mm -hmm. those, that's what I thought. That's why I didn't add that in the other stuff. But yeah, so the idea is also that, that it's, not, it's not eternal, like how most fundamental Christians view hell as a place of forever suffering, but we understand it's a place of purification where we can return back. So you lose your soul, but you lose it for a time, right? You lose it. Basically, you lose it because you lose the possibility of gaining it. We don't have it right now, but we have the possibility of gaining it through the human form. Through awakening the essence, right, and creating these vehicles, we can, we can incarnate our soul. It's only on the human level that you can do that. And then if you, 108 lives go by, you didn't do it, you go back down around. You can't incarnate the soul as an animal or as a plant or as a rock. And then infernal regions that back up around, back to human, and then you have another chance. And then if all that, you know, if you never do it, then at the end of the, the second death, you go back to the source as a small spark. So you do return to the source, he teaches, but it's, it's almost like an unconscious return. It's really mechanical. The idea of why hell is so hard for most people to understand, like, why are we being punished? It's like, you're not really being punished. You're being cleansed of your ego that you're identifying with. And because you're identified with the ego and you think the ego is you, that <coughs> ego is being ripped away from you, kind of cleansed and purified. You feel like it's a part of you that's being tortured. Uh, Rudolf Steiner writes a lot about that. So that if you have, you know, Who writes about that? Uh, Rudolf Steiner is a, oh, another, okay. another kind of esoteric guy. But he writes, you know, if you're really gluttonous, the reason why it's like hell is because now you you, you you use the physical organism organism to uh, you know supply you with happiness. You, you you're eating all this food, and now you don't have a physical body, and you desire this food, and you don't have the instrument to attain it. You can't attain it. 
And Samael talks about it in more depth with the desires and the egos. All these egos that are alive right now, they're not going to return to the source, right? Because the egos aren't, aren't part of the spark. They're basically getting washed off of the, of the kernel of soul spark. But if you identify with them, it feels like you're being punished, you're, you're being tortured. And that's, that's just a picture from Dante's Inferno, which you guys have talked about already, which is a, which is a really interesting and uh, really interesting work. Uh, Dante Alighiero being a, a master, what uh, you know, Wolfgang Lee and Master Samuel all said. So it's a really interesting to read the work from that perspective. Another one is if you ever read the works of William Blake, that, that guy was tapped in too. So there's a lot of guys or people in general through through the you know through a long course of history you find these flashes of light everywhere. You can put them together and the picture makes sense. But here's uh, Jesus being tempted by Satan, the divine master Jesus. Quotes. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He also says, what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? The idea is there's nothing here that's worth your divine soul. And the idea is that we cling to the physical world so much that we don't even want to work on the path, and that's giving up our soul for the physical world. It's basically doing this picture. We want the kingdom. The kingdom being the physical world, we're so attached and in love with the physical world, and our egos love it so much that we don't even want to do the work, and only through doing the work can you incarnate the soul. So he's saying, what is a man profit? You, a rich king, you get everything you want in this world, and you're still going to have to you know, pay the piper. You're still going to die. It's still going to come. It's still going to be leveled by death, and then you're going to have to deal with it then. So, I mean, these quotes kind of show us um, that the soul is something above and beyond us right now. How can one attain their soul? Let's get a little happier, see what we can do about this. Not be so glum. This is done by disintegrating our defects, right? by eliminating the psychological aggregates, by destroying the egos through self-awareness, self-observation, self-remembering, death in motion, meditation, and alchemy to build the solar bodies. These, these terms I put on again to, to make sure everybody remembers them. And uh, you guys all remember what each one of these are. Maybe. If not, we can talk about them a bit. These three kind of are like a, like a, a step one onto the other, right? Self-awareness is like if you're wrapped in your mind and you're thinking, it's like just ground yourself with your senses first, you know, breathe. And then self-observation is watching yourself, and watching the egos. Self-remembering is the hardest one, but it's like the idea of constantly remembering that you have a father who's in secret, you have a divine mother, you have a, this divine job that you're in charge of and you're supposed to be doing, which is easier when we're here and harder when we're out there, you know? It's harder. It's easy to get wrapped up with swinging wrenches and being a mechanic and just living that lifestyle and then come here and be like, oh yeah, I've read some stuff I'm supposed to be doing, right? Death in motion is when you attack an, a, an eagle head on as soon as you realize it pops up. Just made fun of my glasses, I'm like, what? That's an eagle, son. Just be cool, man, be cool. You know, then you pray to your divine mother right at that point to say, take this eagle from me, please destroy this eagle. That's the idea of death in motion, kind of attacking it head on. Self-observation is watching yourself throughout the whole day. And then in meditation, what we're going to talk about in the other lecture is bringing those observations to a meditation and then reflecting upon them deeply and trying to understand where, where this ego came from, what fed it, what, what caused it to come out, what effects did it have on the surroundings. And we're going to get into all that stuff in the, mm -hmm. in the next lecture. So also, the soul and the ego are like oil and water. They do not mix, right? You can't, you can't really incarnate soul with ego. They're, they're the opposites. He that wants to possess his soul will have to eliminate the undesirable psychic aggregates that we all carry inside of us. We all have this. If you want to incarnate your soul, you have to do the, the psychological work. A lot of times we get caught up a lot on the, on the alchemical work. And the idea, well, if I don't have a partner right now, then what's the point of even doing this? It all starts with the psychological work. And there's so much psychological work to do. We have to start realizing and looking at our defects and understanding them. Samai even talks about like meditating on the egos for five years, up to five years and on certain egos. And it's a long work. It's a long, long work. And it's some of the most important thing. Because you could, theoretically, you could you know, have a partner and be practicing alchemy and building these bodies and not eliminating ego. And then basically the ego can have these higher bodies to use which can, up to a certain point, can happen. And they call them ham hamismusins, 
these double so remember we talked about in Dremelec that one guy there's a good in Dremelec and the bad one it was hard to understand why there was that it's because they built these bodies up to the level of the human soul and uh, didn't eliminate ego so now the ego is using this Bodhisattva body and then the divine soul never falls the soul that's above it never falls so only below it and that's that, that was that story if you remember in Dremelec it was, it was when we were doing the uh, invocations and it was kind of tricky Conjurations. So we have to we have to get rid of anger, the lust, the greed, the pride, envy, sloth, gluttony. All, all those are the seven. That's the seven-headed dragon, right? And they all have many offshoots, and they're all tangled up within each other. Um, each time a psychic aggregate is eliminated, like each time this is a, this is an ego. We all you've heard all the terms for egos, right? They use a million of them: psychic aggregates and undesirable defects. But every time a psychic aggregate is eliminated. A virtue crystallizes. One that eliminates the ego of hatred crystallizes the virtue of love. One that eliminates the ego of pride crystallizes the virtue of humbleness. One that eliminates the ego of selfishness crystallizes the virtue of altruism. So we see once we start eliminating these parts, it's good to think of it as like eliminating these evil things, but we're really incarnating these higher things. That this evil thing was in its place taking its power. Um, the virtues slowly begin to crystallize within the essence as it becomes liberated. So the idea is we eliminate an ego and free some essence. And these virtues start to crystallize within the, within the essence. So the more that's unbottled, the more virtue that can crystallize within it. Little by little, we begin to crystallize the soul. The soul becomes crystallized by the essence. Just as water is crystallized into ice, so too does essence crystallize into soul. This is why you need to do the psychological work. This is the most important work that we have to do right now. Essence is a fraction of the soul, right? This essence we have is, is a small fraction of the soul. So the more we free, the more we free, the more we have. The more of it can crystallize actual soul. As it is liberated, more and more soul is crystallized within it. This is why essence is the necessary psychic material needed to incarnate the soul. So we can kind of we can kind of see how that would work, and then with alchemy it creates the it creates the solar bodies, and all of this thing. And it's kind of you need them you need them both, but most importantly right now is is to work on psychology. The most important thing is the three factors, right? Everybody remembers that, right? The birth, the death, and the sacrifice. No matter what we do, that's the most important thing that he always teaches us. So the death is a big part of that. Alchemy helps with the death. But if you don't have a partner, you still have the work. There's still work you can do. There's a lot of work you can do. And with alchemy, you can become faster in some areas because you're getting more energy now. But, but really, it all starts with the individual first, even before you want to go to advanced practices like, like alchemy. Well, I was going to say, partners come and go. People die. Mm -hmm. yes. so. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. And, it's not, and the crux of the work <laughs> isn't on that part. The crux of the work is on this part, the internal psychology. And once you start eliminating egos, right, and becoming more in touch with the soul and crystallizing that, you can say the divine being will, will put you on the right path. Your being is in secret. The way I, I see it, when it's time for you to do this certain thing, the situation will appear. It will bring itself forward. But most of us, we're, we have to start working on the psychology first. It has to be done first because most of our problems are psychological. And even what, with working with the alchemy, we'd mostly be working on the psychology of, our, of the individual psychology of ourselves first. I mean, it does, it has two effects, right? You can eliminate ego with it, and you can create solar bodies. Eliminating ego is more important right now, if you ask me, but Tom Allen in his later books talk a lot about the psychological work being the most important. Because we're so far away from the spiritual right now, that the idea is we have to start cleaning out, cleaning out our minds, cleaning out the egos. That's what we have to do first. And there's a lot of work that we can all be doing on that. So he was really adamant, really adamant in his later works. He'd have specific questions from his students. They'd, they'd, they'd talk to him and they'd say, um, you know, how can I find more peace? He's like, okay, well, well, what ego are you working on right now? Uh, not one in particular. Well, you have to be working on the ego in particular right now. That's what you're doing. You have to observe yourself. You have to find an ego, and you have to start working on those egos. And he'd be very blunt that way. He'd ask them, he'd say, well, I want to... I want to incarnate my, my higher be self, but I'm having trouble. What should I do? Which ego are you working on? Oh, I don't, don't have one in mind right now. You have to have one in mind. You have to be working. 
right now. He was really adamant in a lot of his books. You have to be working right now. And a lot of his meditations were on, okay, everybody find the ego that you're working with, and now we're going to meditate, and we're going to meditate on those egos. And they do a lot of self-reflection kind of meditations, a lot of that stuff. So in, in his mind, his later books on the psychology were some of the most important ones he wrote because it's the ones that we need the most. The other ones are true, and all that stuff is well and good, and knowing all the, the tree of life and all that stuff is good, but you have to start with the psychology. you got to start cleaning out the barn first, or else it's going to be all for naught, basically, which we can all do, a little bit at a time. It's not, a, it's not overwhelming. You can do it without feeding your egos. You can all do it. So this is in review now. We must react to the situations of life with awareness. Remember, we talked about awareness. That's the highest state of reaction. It's above the mechanical emotions and the calculating intellect. Awareness cultivates the inner mind. They're pretty much products of each other. Imagination, inspiration, and intuition lead to the development of the inner mind. These steps. And apparently they, they'll, they'll come one after another. You start working on your imagination. You start imagining these things. And then you'll have an experience that inspires you. Then you get inspired. And then the experience has become more real. And then it's more of an intuition. And intuition is kind of like the process of the inner mind. You're not thinking thoughts now because it's above the intellect. It's intuition. It's direct experience, direct knowledge. And the inner mind is the instrument of the being. That's why the inner mind has to be cultivated. So you start imagining what? Like, uh, your... Well, in the, like, we'll, we'll talk about it in our, in our next lecture. But even the idea like when you start imagining... The idea of going back in your day and observing what egos, trying to remember which okay. egos, but using your consciousness, you're using your imagination okay. now to start seeing the pictures of your day yeah. and what the ego popped up and, and what it looked like and what it caused you to do and what it, effect it had on other people. That's a conscious use of the imagination. Okay. That's how we use it. The inner mind leads to the direct experience of truth. With experience, authentic faith is born within us. Because now we know faith is, is like the child of truth. You don't have to believe in something. If you experience it, you can have faith in it. In order to develop the inner mind, we must comprehend the mind on all its levels. 49 levels of the mind. I believe. <laughs> so subconscious and everything. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot. That includes the subconscious. We must eliminate the psychological aggregates, the egos. We have to eliminate the egos. That's the death. That's the death. No death, birth, sacrifice, that's the death. The mind must be made receptive and passive in order to be used as an instrument of the being. If there's egos in there agitating your mind and using you for other things, you're never going to be in connection with your higher being. It's always going to be a disconnect there because you're not going to receive that telegram. When the egos are eliminated, essence is free. So as we eliminate these egos, we start to free more and more essence, more and more consciousness. Essence is a fraction of that which is called soul. When we destroy vice, we cultivate virtue. So by destroying the, the egos, we start cultivating the flip side of it, as we talked about. The essence that slowly accumulates, little by little, begins to crystallize that which is called soul. So the more essence is freed, the more soul can begin to become crystallized. And it's a slow, slow process, too. So that's why you have to work, continually work and work and work at it. The more essence that is freed, the more soul becomes crystallized. So the more, the more of our essence that we have taking over our consciousness, the more we'll be able to understand, and the more we'll be able to perceive from the being, and it, and it'll become, I don't know if it'll become easier, but it'll be, it'll be on a different level, a different level of consciousness. We'll be understanding more things that we don't understand now. Soul crystallizes in the essence. The essence must be freed from the egos. The egos must be eliminated from the mind. That's kind of the real synthesis of what we said tonight here, basically. Question no. Yeah. So, you can see that it's not like we're, we're not eliminating the mind. We're eliminating the defects from the mind so that the mind can be used by the being. The being can use the mind once we start crystallizing the soul, then we can contain this higher being. And that's uh, basically what this entire lecture has been about. Is there any questions? I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Free your mind, the end. Free bird coming through. <laughs> Look out. What was that guy's name you mentioned? Oh, yeah, I mentioned his yeah, name was Rudolf Stein. Oh, Rudolf Stein. I don't talk too much about other teachers, but Samael does talk.